Investigations, and we're here in Rossville, Illinois, at the Haunted Opera House. We're going to go inside and see what we can get. Yeah. You won't. If you do, it means somebody's going to come yeah. in the door. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get started, where that light is right there, there's that big round picture. Go over there and look at that picture real quick. That's my creepy pictures. That's one of them old. I don't know if I'll say it looks like a kid picture. It's an old death picture. You know, obviously uh, somebody in the family has died. But look at the, the way the sun bleached that picture out. Mm -hmm. Look at the faces. Yeah, they're all. Look, it's almost down. hideous how right bad they are. You know? Right yeah. You can barely see some of them where they were supposed to be at. Yeah, probably have this. Uh, you start out, I'll tell you that the building was built in 1904. Sure. And it was built as an opera house slash Mason's Lodge, which meant this first floor was an opera house. And the top floor at that time was the uh, Mason's Lodge. There was a balcony. And you can kind of see where it, it was um, between the two floors. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, uh, if somebody wanted entertainment, they would go to the opera. This actually was a state-of-the-art opera house. They said it was absolutely beautiful in its day. It was top-notch. Um, they talk about how it might cost you a uh, dollar fifty to buy a ticket back then, mm -hmm. and the average wage at that time was like fifteen cents an hour. So oh, yeah. a ticket was pretty high priced. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time, there was an entrance in the back of the building where people could bring in their horse and buggy and literally go in underneath and park in the basement, so they wouldn't have to get out in the rain. And they just walk up the steps and they watch their their opera and everything, and they go back down and then leave at the end of it all. So it really was something special in its day. The Opera House became a non-profitable uh, business around the 1920s. Uh, and if you think about it, you've got not only actors you have to pay, but you've got stagehands you've got to pay. And you've got to pay them every night. And you've got to pay them well enough that a performer could justifiably pay hotel fees, which was that house. And that house was right straight across the road. And it ended up burning down in 1911. Um, so you were paying out some pretty significant money every night that there was a performance. Well, nowadays you buy one film and you could show it a hundred times and collect money each time. And you don't have to pay out. You know, mm -hmm. So the silent films were a big thing. Uh, after the vaudeville acts and all that, they went into silent films, and by 1924, they basically deemed it as being non-profitable and basically shut down the opera house end of it. Um, it's been a multitude of things since. It's been an auction house. It's, uh, it's been a... In 1924, 25, uh, some guy came in, put up great big steel beams in the back, and you'll see them, and he extended the balcony floor all the way to the back, creating a second floor, which means the Mason's Lodge was at that point the third floor. The Masons hung out until 1947, and when they left, they cited it was just to The Mason's to Lodge on the third floor, like I said, they left out in uh, 1947. They moved down a block, and they moved out of there shortly after, and merged with uh, the Mason's Lodge up here in Hookston, and I believe that that one now is defunct. They don't have meetings or anything like that anymore. I recently found out that um, one of the things about the Masons, which was really kind of unusual that you would have an opera house, which would be the busiest business in, th in town or the busiest location with the most secretive location. The Masons were so secretive about everything. Um, they would not allow women to be on the third floor when the Masons were meeting. 
However, when they were done, they would allow the Eastern Star, which was the female version of the Masons, to meet up there. After 1947, they had some proms and some dances and various things, but after that, it just basically just pissed Not that it's that far, but it would not feel good to drop even mm -hmm. that distance. <laughs> the little drawings on the wall that you see uh, were put up during the, uh, the time it was an auction house. I have no idea who drew them. Uh, somebody came in the other day and they thought they might know who did it and they were going to check into it, and, uh, you know, so that would be a neat thing to, to be able to say who the artist was that, that actually drew them. Because I imagine all that was freehand kind of stuff. That's not stencils where it was just pointed off, you know. Um, okay, so this area right here is where the stage This is where the stage would have been. And you'd been looking up there, there would have been a balcony up there. I'm not sure exactly how all that, you know, was set up in the day. I guess it was all open, looking down on the stage, looking over the top of the audience and down to the stage. When you're sitting in the audience and you're moving props around, uh, opening and closing curtains, various things of that nature, and you'll see some of that up there, and I guess that is, parts of that is Do still you have any there. history of anybody being hurt during, I mean, that's a pretty dangerous job, I imagine. Okay, um, yeah, now we're, now we're kind of getting into the paranormal end of this. Oh. Um, the only thing I know as a fact, two guys were moving some very heavy farm equipment into the building to be auctioned off when it was an auction house. Mm -hmm. And the machinery collapsed and it killed both of them instantly. Right here on the, the, best, the best way I can describe some of the paranormal activity, I had four people come into the building at four different times. All four claimed to be sensitives or had the ability to talk to spirits or communicate or see them when we can't. The okay. most unusual part of it was that all four had never seen each other, still to this day, had never seen each other, never talked to each other, no communication whatsoever, but all four said the exact same thing about this building. They all said there was one spirit definitely here, and he hangs out around this wood pile in this basic corner. He is a grouchy old fart that means no harm to anybody, but he's a perfectionist. He has to have things his way. But since we're kind of getting into it, uh, a friend of mine and I were here working in the front room one day, and, we and just as I turned to go towards the switch, I, I just yelled out, well, we're leaving now. And she was standing at the door when she yells out, yeah, but he'll be back. You know, we're, we're having fun. We're laughing and joking. Yeah, but he'll be back. Flip the switch off as I'm walking out. I said, yeah, I'll be back. And about this time, definitely from this general corner, you could hear plain as day, get out. I opened the door and it turned out to be the gal that lives the block down. It's the daughter of the guy that filled this place. And uh, she just asked what was going on, you know. She saw the truck and everything, and she was kind of excited, you know. It's nice that somebody's doing something. And um, I asked her, I said, well, you lived here. Can you tell us anything about any paranormal experiences? Anything ever happened? Oh, no, no, never. Never experienced anything. Well, a few months ago, I called her up because there was some stuff I thought that she might be interested in having. Mm -hmm. um, turns out she wanted everything, but <laughs> <laughs> um, she, as soon as she showed up to get this stuff, uh, she said, hey, she said, I got to admit something. I said, what? She said, I lied to you that night. She said, there was always activity in this building. She said, but I was a single mother, had uh, several kids I was taking care of that weren't even hers. Um, and she said, I just couldn't let that bother me. She said, I just looked the other way. I didn't pay any attention to it at all. She said there was always noises, always voices, and always something. Yeah. She had a picture on the wall that was taken of her on the second floor, and it looks like there's a transparent little boy standing there trying to hold her hand. Oh, wow. And so, you know, she didn't even bother to get into that. I had to find that out from basic people that just happened to come by. Where's that ghost picture? Where's that at? Are you saying up here in the shop all the time? 
<laughs> now it's not here, but, uh, you know. The people of this town have been extremely friendly, very, very nice. Um, and it's very interesting how so many people come by and they said, well, I, I was raised in this town. I've been in this town all my life. And they said, we knew as kids this place was haunted. But nobody ever talks about it. Nobody ever wanted to admit it, you know. Um, this one lady came in and she said that they would walk back and forth to school, which is just a couple blocks down. And she said they had a whole group of people that would walk down the street at the same time. They'd get to a certain point on the street, and everybody would literally walk across to the other side so they didn't have to walk past yeah. the other not only heard with their ears, but caught on tape um, what sounds like an, a woman moaning, like she's in serious pain, like kind of like a, oh, kind of a groan, yeah. moan kind of thing. And it was kind of hot and miserable when they decided they wanted to leave, but they said, let's go down to that really didn't want the second floor and try to So what they decided to do was have, there were four of us, so they had one person in each doorway everybody facing into the room. Yeah. The one guy is kind of the leader of their group. He was standing here. And he had his backpack on with all his equipment stuff in. All of a sudden, he's jerked backwards. And then he almost falls on his face because he's trying to pull himself forward. And he screams out, something just grabbed my backpack. The guy standing in the doorway over here immediately ran up with his camera and started snapping pictures in this direction, right through the doorway. Yeah. He's, the first three pictures he caught, the first two, there was a black mass right here in the doorway. You can see the outside edges oh. around it, but the doorway there was completely blacked out and you could not see on into the okay, other Okay, now we're going into the area that I call the flies or the prop room. This floor was not here, so we would actually be looking all the way down to the stage of the opera house. Oh, okay. Uh, this would have been the area they would have been doing off the catwalks and various things. He's off. standing right now is where the trap door is. Right, oh, there's the trap door. <laughs> and oh, hey. the trap door basically oh, was okay. part of the Mason's Lodge. Uh, you can actually look up and read various things about what the trap door was used for. It was part of the initiations, it was various things. Uh, it actually goes all the way down to the second floor, so it would go beyond this floor all the way down to where uh, the piano room was. It's all closed off. It's just down there. There's mm -hmm. really nothing in there. Uh, you guys are welcome to open it up, but if you do, just be real very, very, very careful. I don't know about falling down there. This was known as the closet. It mm -hmm. was part of the initiation rituals. They would have three people at a time blindfolded and put in there. Um, and every Mason's Lodge had what they called the Tyler. The Tyler was in charge of security. Uh, that wasn't his name, that was just his title. Um, he would be in charge of the guys Going through their initiation. The small stage was part of the initiation rituals. Um, those are the three bricks I was talking about that got blocked out. Yeah. We had a girl sitting there, and there was a uh, black mass entity that was kind of messing with her. And we got several pictures of the mass coming down over the top of her and blocking out the stage. Um, with the being plaster, you get the little white. Mm -hmm. spots in the back, it was so dense and dark that you could not see that. You could not see the bricks. You couldn't see various things. It was too dark. Uh, and then you take the next picture and you might see the bricks, but the mass is up over here. You oh, know, okay. That kind of thing it was moving around. And at one point I was telling Brandy that um, the girl had kind of an unusual look on her face and she had a jacket on and she zipped the jacket up and crossed her arms like this. She's 15. And she announced to us that something had touched her inappropriate. Oh, so okay. <laughs> she, and she just kind of spent the rest of the time just sitting there like that, you know. But her mom was the one that was taking pictures. Oh. What we do is we'll come into the hallway here, and with, of course, total lights out, you're looking down this way, and what you see is 
something on the other side of that doorway and it's like it's it's standing in the doorway like this and all of a sudden it'll stick its head around and look at you and then back again and then it'll step out look at you and then back again and it's doing this peekaboo yeah. kind of stuff okay so you'll also hear footsteps coming down the wooden floor oh wow we go down to that end to see what's going on and all of a sudden it's down here <laughs> there's a street lamp out front and with that big window there it'll light up that whole stairwell and you'll see things moving around peeking at you doing all kinds of weird stuff um, one day I was down at the Casey's I come out of the Casey's and if you were off I'll show you down here show you down here. Uh, I came out of the Casey's and I got to a position where I could see uh, the building and what you see is the back section of the building including this window this is really the only thing out here that you can see and you can see the case is plain as day mm -hmm. and I just happened to look up I was on the other side of that van and I looked up here and there's somebody looking down at me and he's tall his head was up here into this uh, oh, wow. railing or this section of the window so he's got to be at least six foot five. Yeah. Okay. And I'm looking up at who in the hell would be in the opera house? You know. So I come running over here. Dude, there's somebody in your opera house. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm sitting out there watching the stuff. He said, I heard a noise. I got out of the car and looking around. Didn't see anything. Just happened to look up this way. And he said, there's somebody in the window looking at me. And he was, I mean, he was so dead serious, you know. And I'm like, well, great, somebody else has seen it, you know. Yeah. Um, since then, just about everybody in the Casey's has seen somebody in the window. Oh, wow. Um, in some cases, they say he's waving at them. 